Whoa, it's kind of bright. What's up? What's up? Lee Carson here. Forbidden knowledge. I'm popping in on a late night. It's 106 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I'm drinking my hyperhydration. I'm going to do some Q&A over here tonight. Let's see who's up. Let's see who's ready for the knowledge. Late night, late night knowledge. What's up, Rap Reaper? Hacks? Father and son, Gomez, what's happening? All right, investment. Hey, man, appreciate you, Reaper. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. A lot of big things coming. Stephen Edward, CRTV, Ethan, Natural, a new queen, Tom Valley. Wow, you guys are really awake yet. You guys are like me, man. That's crazy. I'm just sitting over here working on some stuff. I said, you know what? Let me just pop in here right quick for a second. What's up, King Westside? Fifth Dimension, Sean. Above Average Ant. Good question. All right, I'm going to take the first question of the night. So uh, Above Average was asking about the underground world in China. It's actually real, okay? Uh, let me make sure this thing is on. I'm on the uh, I'm on the, the computer mic anyway. I don't even need this. Hold on, let me move this out of the way. I don't even need that. I'm on a computer mic. All right, so um, so that 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 underground uh, that is a huge hole in in the ground in China, where they discovered this entire like totally separate uh, ecology and the geology is totally separate from what's above land and there's light there's trees and forests and and lakes and rivers and all this stuff down there and yes it's real as a matter of fact there's a few places like that on earth i was trying to get to one myself um and that was approximately maybe three years ago four years ago there's another one uh down in south america now, these things exist. The one I was trying to go to was a four-hour hike to get there. And uh, the four-hour hike, and then you have to, it's very, very rugged terrain. And then you have to repel about 200 meters into this opening in the earth. And then you land in an area where there's an actual beach. <clears throat> Underground, there's a beach, okay? Uh, and then it's got its whole, its own system down there. Forest, jungles. There's light that gets down there, uh, animals that live down there and everything else. So there are these giant openings in the earth that open up. No, not a hollow earth, but you got to realize the mass of the earth itself allows for massive openings in, in areas that are that can hold maybe even millions of people. Because uh, we only live on the on the outside surface, the skin. There's so much mass on this planet, you know, in, in terms of the depth that it has. In there are huge openings that go on for hundreds of miles, sometimes maybe even for thousands of miles, these honeycomb-shaped openings that life exists down there, okay? <clears throat> yeah. It's, uh, it's a real thing. Let's see. Uh, yep, can't wait for the you in the book by Matthew LaCroix, Jeffrey Wilson. Yep, that is coming very soon. Um, I'm looking forward to putting out that book, The Epic of Humanity. It's been a long time, a little overdue. We've been trying to get it out, but then we had the global sickness that came, and then Matt moved and then, um, started a new job over at Gaia. And then I got busy with all my life stuff, but we're wrapping up the book now, so we're pretty excited about that. So The Epic of Humanity is going to have the most ancient text than any other book on Earth inside of one book. So we're looking forward to putting this out. It's going to be a revolutionary, revolutionary, groundbreaking book that nobody's done before. All right, let's see what we got here. We're going to be talking about, uh, oh, here's a good question, an Anunnaki question. Why did they name Planet X Biden? That's a great question. <laughs> That's a fantastic question. You know, these elites, they, they play so many games and they... Um, you know, they they hide so much truth in plain sight and they always like they just take little jabs at us. You know, that little jabs, they use a lot of wordplay. 
they'll name things after people like they named that particular object after Biden. Um, why would they do that? Maybe one of his nonprofits helped fund the research or donated money to the astrophysics laboratory. Or, I mean, there's so many reasons there could be why they named it that. But uh, it's pretty interesting that they, that they did. He probably financially has something to do with supporting the research, research or the technology that went into actually discovering this thing, most likely. That's typically when you discover something or you are a person that innovates something, um, but there's some assistance that comes along with that from, from, from the outside. Sometimes they'll co-credit it or they'll give the credit to the person that helped fund it. So that's probably what happened. Cosmic sounds. Are the Anunnaki, are the Anunnaki black or African descent? Good question, cosmic sounds. So if you look into the research of the Sumerian tablets, the Enuma Elish, uh, Epic of Gilgamesh, for example, the Antra Hasis epic, um, you look into the Code of Hammurabi, and uh, you see a couple of different de uh, descriptions of how these people looked. You look into the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is also talking about these same exact people, and then you also go to Egypt and you read the hieroglyphs you find out something very interesting that the uh, the the Atlantean Anunnaki people, because they are Atlantean. So let me just explain that real quick before I go into the It's a generalized term, okay? It means literally um, anybody that came from anywhere outside of Earth to Earth is the Anunnaki. Now, the civilization that they established on Earth is called the Atlantean civilization, which I write about in my book, Compendium of the Emerald Tablets. It was an Atlantean civilization, global Atlantean. It wasn't just a ring city. It was everywhere. Everyone who's on this live right now is sitting or standing or laying down on top of Atlantis as I speak. Uh, so um, now when you look at the description of these people, you find out something very interesting. The initial beings uh, described themselves. They had these, well, the human beings who were scribing in the, in the tablets in Sumeria and Mesopotamia. They had African features, but some were almost like a, uh, uh, you know, when you have the, um, what's the name of that? The Talago type uh, situation where people have these huge patches. They also had some that were extremely dark. Uh, if you look at the Sphinx's uh, face of the Sphinx, it's one of the oldest structures still left in Egypt. That is the face of Amun-Ra's uh, son. And so you're looking at um, the nephew of Thoth, the Atlantean. And so you can see the features clearly show that more of an African feature. Now, what's interesting, though, some were dark. Some had this metallic skin. Some, uh, I hope I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right, but it's the skin that has these light and dark patches all over it. Uh, some of them had um, light skin, um, you know, yellow and, and pale skin, but had African features blue eyes and still had naughty blonde hair not naughty but still blonde interesting descriptions these descriptions are really like all over the place in the epic of gilgamesh uh noah who's actually zazudra in the uh, real text but in the bible he's renamed noah he is a totally different skin color from the black family that he's with his skin is glowing bright he's got blue eyes but he's got these African type features. It's pretty interesting. Then you find out later on that some other beings arrive here and they don't look anything like African features. They had what we would may consider indigenous Native American uh, features. I don't like to use the word Indians, but you know, uh, they had some more Arabic features. Some had more Asian features and some had Caucasian features. So we see this mix of different races and I believe that's because they came from different star systems. That's my personal opinion. When I look at a lot of the ancient texts, I start to see that beings were coming here, but not just from one place, but they were arriving on this planet from multiple uh, places. And according to ancient tribes, this is what they were saying. Thanks for the uh, for the uh, for the donation there, Duran Charles. So I'm not on Streamyard today, so I can't pop it up on the screen like I normally would. I just went right into YouTube and went live. Uh, but yeah, so what you find is that there's a mix of races. It wasn't just only one race. It was a multiple multitude of races. 
when you go into the animal tablets, okay, you discover that Thoth was sent out with a crew, a team, to go to Kem, the land of Kem, where the Commissions were, okay? These were black people. He was told to help them rebuild civilization after the Great Flood. He takes a crew with him. This crew, they were mixed. They were different races of people, but they were all Atlanteans. They called themselves the Sons of Atlantis. They went there to kickstart, re-kickstart civilization, rebuild Kem, and after they got done rebuilding Kim, Thoth told them to spread around the planet and help do this everywhere on Earth again. Now, everywhere that they went, they ruled over uh, people in those regions. And the reason why I think the people look, uh, let me rephrase this. When, the, when I'm, I'm a black guy. I go, I've been given, I've been given a region of the planet to rule over. I'm a high tech uh, Anunnaki Atlantean. I go to this other region of the Earth. I got people there that I'm supposed to be ruling over. These are now considered to be my people. I'm helping to rebuild an entire civilization on that planet, in that region of the planet. I want people to know that these are these are my people. So what do I do? I genetically mo modify them to have to look like me. And so I believe that these uh, these Atlantean people, when they spread out around the planet, based on wherever they came from or whatever, however they look, whatever race they were. They genetically branded the people that they ruled over to look like them. That's why Asians look like Wang Di, the, the god that came from heaven, the Atlantean that came from heaven and the flying serpent, the first emperor of, of uh, China. Uh, you know, you hear these accounts all over the planet. It's the same story over and over again. And the reason why I come to this conclusion is because when you look into not only the text, but then let's look to science. Look, let's look at genetics. You look at genetics and you find that they found a 2% variance between DNA and genes in different races of people. And they discovered something interesting. We've been lied to. Black people aren't black because our ancestors were in the sun. White people aren't white because their ancestors were lived in mountains. Uh, Native Americans aren't yellow because they eat corn and all this crazy foolishness. So what they found was that there's a 2% variance in genes, even though we still are human, human the human race, there's a 2%, and that 2% would take hundreds of millions of years through natural evolution to happen. So scientists have come to the conclusion, geneticists have come to the official conclusion, it was artificially done about 200,000 years ago. Hmm. When did the Sumerian tablets say? The Sumerian tablets say that human beings were subjugated to labor, to work for them. About when? 200,000 years ago. Chromosome number two by the geneticist in our current day discovered that it was fused and put telomere caps were put on it, put on it about how long ago? About 200,000 years ago. And they say it was an artificial, uh, artificially done thing. It wasn't through evolution. So you go text back to science, tech back to I mean, ancient text back to modern science, ancient text back to modern science. You start seeing this, these synchronicities. Uh, and so what it looks like to me is that uh, these beings were a mixed race of people as they spread around the planet to duplicate rebuilding the land of Kim and different parts of the earth, which is why you see pyramids everywhere and temples everywhere that, that resemble each other with slightly different motif on them. The people that ruled over those class of people genetically modified them to look like them. And that's how we have multiple races of people on the planet, because the people that, that ruled over us in those regions in that deep antiquity were different races of people. All right, let's see what else we got here. All right. <clears throat> and please, guys, don't fight over the race stuff. It, just, it doesn't make any sense. If, if, if a black person wants to know about ancient history to find out if people are black in ancient history, let them find out. Like, just don't put, don't, don't do it to us. Just relax, okay? I don't like it when people start to go, you know, you shouldn't be asking about race. No, we should be because we need to know. You got to remember that black people's entire ancient past have been robbed and stolen away. We don't know anything about ourselves. We're one of the very few races of people on this planet that are completely lost. Thank you, uh, Czar, for the $35. And thank you, uh, Walking Bankroll, for the donation as well. You got to realize that we don't know. We don't know who we are. We don't know anything. We've been, our, our history has been completely erased and modified and changed, which has a direct effect on our consciousness. 
So one, it's like if you were adopted and then you you have a quest, you have this inner inner yearning to find out who was your mom, who was your dad. And people spend their entire lives researching and trying to trace and track down who their original parents were. It's just yearning inside. So if you hear a black person asking questions about were these people black or were they black pharaohs or whatever, don't chastise them. Don't get angry at them. Don't write, you know, we we're all the same race. Yeah, we know that we're all the same race. I mean, that's common sense. But what we're trying to say is we're trying to get down to understand, like, who we are. Where do we come from? What, what are we connected to? Because if you look at the most chastised and most abandoned and most abused people on the planet Earth, unfortunately, right now, it's black people. For thousands of years, it's been this way. And so um, people are just trying to reconnect to find, is there any semblance of anything in ancient history that had any honor and dignity? Or have we always been beat down and downtrodden our entire our entire existence? That's an important question to ask, don't you think? Just for the sight, but just for the psyche, just so people can understand, like, man, are we always in this situation like this? Have we always been the worst people on the planet in terms of the way we've been treated? Or was there a golden era where we had, you know, we had a, a time that we um we had good things going on and we and we lived good and people didn't abuse us and uh and and kick us and and shoot us in the back of our heads. I think that's a real simple, I think that's a real honest and, and a simple question to, to be wanting to know. I mean, it's not even like a stretch to be like, hey, were there any black people back? I want to know too. That's why I did the last week, I think it was, I did the black, the hidden black queens and kings. I'm going to do a part two of Egypt, of ancient land of Kem. People need to know that. They just need to know to feel, to feel connected to something. You know, it's it's a natural human instinct to want to know where you came from and what you're connected to. What was your past like? What was it like back then? Um, and so that's why I do these videos. It ain't about black people are better than white people and all this other kind of stuff. It's just to to educate and bring forth information that might bring some closure or some confirmation to some people to make them feel like, wow, you know, OK, it's good to know that it wasn't always the way it is right now. OK, anyway. So when black people ask about their ancient history, please don't, don't, don't say, don't comment against them. Please don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, did Enlil create division between races? Yes. Good question. Enlil created division between races. Enlil created division between people. Enlil created uh, divide and conquer tactics. He created chemtrails. I'm going to do a whole video on that. Ancient chemtrails. He used to dry the crops out with these chemicals. Um, he created... Uh, you know, you know, the same thing that uh, Nazi Germany was doing, he was doing. That's where probably Hitler got the ideas from. He got that stuff from Enlil. It's in ancient tablets. The whole Auschwitz and all that stuff, that all comes from the ancient tablets. All these gas chambers and so forth. Enlil was doing that in ancient times. This guy was pure evil. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow night on my, uh, my live podcast. So if you want to hear me talk for a whole hour about Enlil and the God of the Bible, most likely being Satan or Satan, the Lord of Eden, according to the ancient text. Tune in tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, and we can go deep, deep, deep on that. But yeah, Enlil was uh, one of the biggest um, the biggest uh, reasons for divide and conquer, inflation, um, all this stuff. So you're going to find out a lot tomorrow about that. Tomorrow is going to be, tomorrow's topic is, is the God of the Bible uh, really Satan? Question mark. <laughs> So that's tomorrow at 8 p.m., all right? Uh, where did they go? Somebody asked. Michelle, yo, Michelle XO, where did they go? So the Anunnaki is interesting. If you look at the tablets, there were a couple of pyramid wars. Thank you, Duran Charles, for the donation. Uh, there, was a, there were a few pyramid wars in the ancient past, and the evidence of, the, of these pyramid wars is the soil, or really the sand. Sand turned to glass, buildings turned to glass. If you go to Mohenjo-daro in the Indus Valley, you see bodies still laying in the street holding hands. The bodies are are uh, vitrified, and uh, there's they still have a higher than background level of radiation. If you use a Geiger counter, the buildings that they lived in, they're still there. Uh, they're still vitrified. In other words, the, the the sand bricks that they made to to build these structures are turned to glass. That means three thousand degree temperature heat. Look at Africa, where you see that swath of that massive desert going across, and you see how dried out Giza is. 
that's a result of a war. Giza is not like that because uh, this, you know, oh, temper to climate change and it just dried out and turned into a gigantic desert. Giza was plush with coconut trees and palm trees and the Nile River running up right by the side of the pyramids. And then after the last pyramid war, that area was it's almost like fallout. If you go to Giza in Africa and you put your hand in the sand and you scoop it up a few times, you'll eventually come up with small balls of glass. That glass is evidence of 3,000 plus temperatures that heated that area in a war, an ancient war, uh, where Amun Ra was battling for control of the planet. And so after that war, there was a, a situation where there was this, uh, they call the evil wind. Sounds like nuclear fallout to me. People's hair was falling out. Their eyes were bleeding. Their, their fingernails were falling out. All signs of radiation sickness. Uh, and so some of these people left and some tried to find safe harbor on the planet and stayed. There were already offspring here. And so I believe that these beings in some way are still here via their offspring. Maybe a couple of them are still, a few of them are still ruling from behind the scenes, playing mankind like a puppet. Uh, it's pretty interesting. You know, you, you hypothesize all day long as to where they are, but it's potential, it's, it's prob the probability that their offspring are still here is real, I think. Whether they are still or not is a question mark. We can only guess. Could the huge granite box located in the pyramid have housed the nukes where, that they were hidden? Good question, Doris Sellen. I don't know if they housed nukes in those granite boxes. It's possible. They could have. But I think that those giant granite boxes uh, were most likely housing the halls of Amenti technology. That was the rejuvenation chamber technology that would sit inside those uh, gigantic, empty, uh, megalithic sarcophaguses like at the ones at the Serapium in Saqqara. They weigh about 70, 80 tons each. Uh, and there's nothing inside of them. They're perfectly clean on the inside. I've been inside of them. And so uh, I feel like uh, that's where the Halls of Amenti technology, and the Halls of Amenti technology, if you go into the Emerald Tablets of Thoth and read them, it talks about him going into these underground chambers like the one at Saqqara and accessing these uh, chambers where they would have this technology on the inside of them that would allow them to uh, clone themselves and then transfer their consciousness into new avatar bodies and walk around. They said, Thoth's in Emerald Tabis, Thoth, he says, I would walk amongst men, but unlike a man. And they would, they would, they would assemble these bodies and they would transfer their their minds into them and they would walk around the, in these avatar bodies and they would do this for eons. Okay. Um, Vernon Peoples, why the land of Kem chosen to jumpstart civilization and was Zeptepi in the land of Kem? Good question, man. Good questions. So the land of Kem was chosen because uh, according to Thought Me, who was actually Ea e e Enki, Thoth's dad, he said that that was the location to move headquarters because there was an ancient temple there and there were survivors. So that, that area had already had a history before the flood, pre-diluvial, of being a high civilization, high tech, okay, super high tech. The flood was so big and so massive. Now, not only did it destroy Kim and, the, and most of the world, but generations had gone by where so the people there didn't even have any remembrance of how to build or how to how to use any tech. They had really fallen. And so since the survivors were there and they had a lineage of greatness, they decided to pick the land of Kim as a, as a location to rebuild initially. And so that's what they did. Uh, and so, it was, you know, it's pretty amazing. And then Zip Tepe is the location of the land of Kem. Zep Tepe is when the sky gods, according to the ancient Egyptians in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, not according to Billy Carson, according to the ancient uh, peoples of, of Africa, Zep Tepe is when the sky gods came to earth and turned mud into a kingdom that was post-alluvial. Thank you, Dur uh, Duran Charles, for the uh, donation. That's post-alluvial, okay? So, uh, so after the Great Flood, uh, they chose the land of Kim and people were there 
and they felt like this is the lineage that we want to help re-kickstart first. And once we reestablish this home base, then we're going to spread out and duplicate this all over the planet. Okay, I clearly talk about that. It's in my book, Compendium of the Animal Tablets. And it's all backed by the ancient text directly. You hear the words coming directly out. Thank you, DJ Walking Bankroll for the uh, D Walking Bankroll for the uh, donation. So that's what's going on. So that was a good question. Ethan says, "Is there a spaceship under the Sphinx?" Thoth said in the tablets. Yes, in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, Thoth says that under the Sphinx's paw, you can find my ship. And he says, "Far in the far in the future." He says, "Far in the future." from deep space, an enemy is coming. Pretty interesting. Because i never seen any other text talk about a future enemy except for the Emerald Tablets. It's the only one I've ever seen. And he says that the person that can um, release, release my ship from underneath the Sphinx will be able to defeat them with ease. So obviously, there's some malice. These, these people coming from deep space, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but they're not good. Supposedly, according to both the Atlantean, not according to me, they're not good people. And so what he says is he's got this ship underneath the Sphinx, and maybe maybe you have to dematerialize it and rematerialize it above land. But uh, you know, we know that uh, they did ground penetrating radar scans of the Sphinx around the Paw, and they saw that a mile deep, one mile deep, there's a huge object down there. OK, that's well-known information. Now, what's scary is there are tunnels that lead all underneath the grounds of Giza. Some go all the way from um, from Giza all the way to the ziggurat of Ur, OK, in Arabia. So in Iraq. And so um, there's these tunnels down there. It could be possible that the military has already gotten to the, that object or whatever it is via underground tunnels. We don't know. I'm just guessing. But it's pretty interesting that the Emerald Tablets talk about a, a futuristic event where somebody's coming from deep space that's not nice and that we would need to defend ourselves. Pretty interesting. Um, let's see. Is it true that Kip... Uh, Chemites and those things move so fast. Wow. Hold on, let me go down. Let me scroll back down. Chemites and Nubians originated from the Great Lakes region. Great Lakes would be in, in the Americas. That information, I'm not really sure. I don't know. I know that if you go into um, the ancient texts, you discover that the Atlantean civilization has spread all around the world, including the Olmecs that left Africa and went to Mesoamerica to help folk kickstart an entire civilization in the Americas. Uh, originating from the Great Lakes region, I'm not sure. However, they did find something interesting in the Michigan area. They discovered a, um, a Stonehenge underneath the water there. And on those stones that are these giant pillars, just like the ones in Stonehenge, carved into them, are uh, one of them has a mastodon carved into it. That's like, you know, an Ice Age, uh, you know, creature. So it's pretty interesting that they found that. And... Um, it leads to the fact that these people were global, a global civilization, whoever they were. Did the Anunnaki bring psilocybin and mushrooms? Uh, that smile Carter, smile Carter. Good question. I don't know if they brought psilocybin and mushrooms, but I do know that they brought um, cannabis and they taught human beings how to make beer. And they also brought monatomic gold, how to make monoatomic mono gold, I'm sorry, monoatomic gold and they also taught humans how to use and create uh, colloidal silver using electrolysis. So pretty interesting that they, did, that they showed people how to do this in ancient times. And they created something called the elixir of life, which included CBD oil, monoatomic mono gold water, and a mix of colloidal silver water, uh, along with some other herb that's not specified, some kind of plant. And they used it to create something called the elixir of life. And it was for healing the heroes of old for the Anunnaki directly. Only they were allowed to drink this stuff and supposedly cured all their ailments and diseases and sicknesses and illnesses and pains and everything else uh, and made them smarter. So pretty interesting. So weed is from another planet. Yes, it is. <laughs> 
Yeah. Monotomical extends your DNA telomeres and increases lifespan. Yes, that's why I sell it. So if you don't know about monoatomic gold, it's on my website. It's actually one of my number one selling products for the last four years. You can go to fourbiddenknowledge.com with the number four, fourbiddenknowledge.com and go to the online store. I have colloidal silver and monoatomic gold uh, in my online store. You can check it out. Uh, let's see here. Let me go back down. All right. Tanika Jackson, is Jehovah the true God? Is there really a creator of this earth according to religion? Great question, Tanika. I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow on my podcast. Tomorrow's podcast is going to be fire. The, the, the topic for tomorrow is, is the God of the Bible a.k.a. Jehovah and Yahweh and all them. Is that Satan? <laughs> question mark. I'm asking a question. But I'm going to bring some compelling information that's going to make you scratch your head. Uh, I believe that uh, the God of the Bible is actually uh, Satan or Satan, the Lord of Eden, according to the tablets. But uh, we're going to go over that tomorrow and talk about that extensively for a full hour. That's a big topic to talk about. You, got, you can't just answer that question without bringing facts. So I'm going to bring the receipts tomorrow. We're going to have a great talk tomorrow. 8 o'clock, I'm going live. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on this YouTube channel. I'm going to go live, and I want you to share this with everyone. Make sure everybody got the link to this one. All the Christians and all of them, bring them all in here. They need to see this ASAP. All right? Do you have any videos about the firmament or inner earth theory? Uh, Eno High, great question. I am working on an entire series called The Anunnaki History. And it covers extensively uh, the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation, which talk about the firmament. The firmament has nothing to do with a flat planet. Just wipe that information out of your brain. That's a fabrication. And any images that you see floating around that depict a dome structure are all created by an artist. There's no ancient text. I've got the, I've got the largest collection of anybody you'll probably ever encounter of ancient texts, tablets, cylinder scrolls, scriptures, papyruses, right here in my house. Now, if you don't believe me, look at the photos of me in my house and, and all my stuff I got. There's many pictures of me sitting around this stuff. There is no depiction of any dome. The firmament has to do with the uh, atmosphere, and it has to do with the separation of Earth as it broke away as a big chunk because it was part of Tiamat. Tiamat is another planet that cracked into pieces in ancient times, millions of years ago. And Tiamat became the asteroid belt, a.k.a. the hammered bracelet in the ancient Sumerian cuneiform tablets, as well as the biblical account as well. Even they knew about the asteroid belt. So the asteroid belt uh, is, a, is a broken planet. And a huge chunk of it swung away, recoalesced with all the water, separating the water from the water. That was the water from that planet to the water to this planet separating it in the organic life and recoalescing as earth. And so uh, it's a whole other story. I'm working on a full episode just on that one topic because it's a massive story and I'm going to cover it extensively. <clears throat> but the God of the Bible is not what you think. Now, is there is there a creator of the universe? Yes, I believe that. It's just that the one in that book, that ain't it. And it's actually not it, because the one in the book is actually multiple people. That's something that people haven't really talked about. The fact that the Bible is referencing multiple gods with an S, although they took the S off and call it God, which is a mistranslation by accident on purpose. So we'll cover that tomorrow. Oops, let me see. I saw another good question here. <clears throat> Robert Abrahams is the land of Punt, the birthplace of the ancient Commission gods. The ancient Commission gods didn't come from Earth at all. They came from somewhere else. And so every account, and this is again, this is not a Billy Carson idea. This is the text. This is the ancient Egyptians, the records that they left behind and the glyphs that they left carved into temples in Egypt. They say they came from the sky 
And according to them, they came from different star systems. This is well documented. So these people came from space. There are people living in space in, on, on other planets and other solar systems that look just like us. Do you know why? Because human beings were seeded on this planet. Earth is an abandoned seed colony. I'll say that again. Earth is an abandoned seed colony. We were taken advantage of about 200,000 years ago when these Atlantean people came here and some of them decided to masquerade as gods and pimp us for labor. Let's see what we got here. Fiend King, Tic Tac UFO, the Anunnaki. So good question, uh, Fiend King. He's talking about the UFO, the Tic Tac UFO incident that the Pentagon reported and went worldwide, became a global phenomenon. They're talking about it in, the, in, in Congress and everything else, congressional hearings. Um, they've now confirmed that, yes, these UFOs exist and we can't keep up with them. They're high speed. They can move 6,000 miles an hour. They can bank and turn 90 degrees in a drop of a dime. Um, They've all, we've had 11 close encounters where they actually almost hit our fighter jets. This is now, you know, official documents. This is public knowledge now. It's not a, you know, so me talking about aliens and UFOs, no more mystery, no more Billy's wearing a tinfoil hat. This is released, verified, documented information. Military officers currently in the military verifying that they've, they've uh, almost encountered, almost crashed into some of these, these UFOs. They call them UAPs now because they wanted to change the narrative a little bit. But however, um, these beings, they come and go as they please and nobody can stop them. Nobody can stop them. And they do come and go back and forth from this planet, maybe to, for surveillance, maybe for observation purposes. Um, maybe they found one of those underground places like China where they maybe they even, they're inhabiting part, a part of the planet that we don't have access to. We just don't know. But they do, I do believe that the people come here to visit. And the reason why, Look what humans do. Look what we do, right? We go out to um, we go out to the Serengeti Plains of Africa. We go out into the wilderness of Alaska, and um, we even go deep sea diving in the oceans with cameras. So we actually become the aliens that visit these other animals' domains and layers. Thank you for the for the donation. And so. We actually go there with our camera systems and our, and we hide ourselves and we cloak ourselves, right? If you're out in the, in the jungle and we put cameras in their den, we want to see how they operate, how they live in the den, how the pups live in the den, right? If it's hyena pups or wild dogs or whatever, uh, we want to see how they interact with each other. We want to see how they hibernate. We want to see, we want to inspect them. We actually even alien abduct animals. We alien abduct them. What do we do? We shoot them with a dart gun. Choo! We knock them out, then we alien abduct them and put them in a laboratory and we poke and prod them and experiment and x-ray them. And then when we get done with them, we put a tag on them. We, we put an alien implant on the animal. We put an alien implant so we can track them and then we release them back out and they have lost time. They don't even know where they were, what happened. And now they got this alien implant and we track them wherever they go. We know everything they're doing, who, who to, what, they're, what they're doing, what they're eating what fights they're getting into with their little <laughs> tribes or whatever we, or, you know, to rule over a new territory. We, we, we see it all. We are the aliens in that regard. And so if we're doing that to the animals on earth, imagine another species that's a million years ahead of us. That's interested in seeing, wow, this, um, these people have now developed themselves into, uh, a technology, technological planet that can split the atom, which means nuclear bombs. They analyze the planet, they scan the planet, they find, they find out we have 20,000 nukes on this earth, 20,000. And they say, wow, they got nukes. I wonder if they're a threat to us. So they start analyzing the, the nuclear codes. They hack in, which we know has happened. They've hacked into the nukes many times. This has been well documented and declassified documents that UFOs have showed up at military bases and activated and deactivated nukes. So they hacked in and they said, wow, let's look at the ballistic uh, trajectory of these nukes. Oh, wow. They're, they're, <laughs> these nukes are designed to, and to, to, to blow them up while they're on their own planet. These aren't to protect them from space invaders. These weapons are to kill each other, to kill themselves. We got to keep an eye on these people. These people are crazy. 
we got to keep an eye on these people to see if this civilization will even make it past the 21st century. So now we're going to come in and we got research classes and we got school. We got we got we got school projects where we're taking we're taking students out to go visit Earth and and hide in the clouds and monitor and watch all the stupidity we're doing down here. And we'll alien abduct a few. We'll stun a few of them, knock them out. We'll alien abduct them, probe them, prod them, see what kind of toxins they've been eating. Let's take a blood sample. Let's see how bad they're poisoning themselves. Let's see how dumb they really are. Let's see. Let's see what they're doing here. Let's take a blood sample. Oh, they got microplastics in their blood. Oh, these people aren't too smart. Look what they're doing to themselves. We got to learn from this race of people, this human race. Watch this. Check out. Check this out. They're, they're only living to 75 years. They don't even know how to extend their own lifespan. With all the resources they're spending on blowing themselves up, they haven't researched, they haven't put any of that money into life extension. This is what's happening. They, they are watching us and they're monitoring us to see, is this a civilization that's going to fade into the dark or is it going to overcome these obstacles and then earn a seat at the table in space? Or to may, maybe a federation or whatever. I'm just hypothesizing there, but that's that that's to me that's what's happening. Let's see here, another question. Andrea Kaufman, I, I still think people should be focusing on Antarctica. I agree with you. Antarctica is huge. So there is a giant opening in Antarctica, 35 meter wide opening. And close to that opening, you have all these bases, these military bases, not military, I'm sorry, research bases. They're research bases, no military. But the site is off limits. You can't go there. Now, these research bases represent a lot of the major countries of the world. Uh, and, but what's interesting is there's also another research base there called the Rockefeller Foundation. So they have a base there along with other countries' research bases. And they're all doing something around this opening in the in Antarctica, where they may be, in my opinion, accessing some ancient uh, ancient city that may be partially uncovered due to the melting ice, uh, or they may be melting the ice down there to get access to this ancient city so they can get in there and see if, if there was ancient technology, or maybe they've already accessed it. But they're down there doing something, maybe even interacting with some people who still live there. We don't know, but there's something huge going on down there and buzz aldrin went down there a few years ago and he made a special tweet he said that we're dealing with the ultimate evil and then they shipped him out of there and told him to delete the tweet he deleted the tweet but too late millions of people had already screenshotted it and copied it and printed it out and saved it and reposted it and everything else it was too late he saw something down there something that made him say we're dealing with the ultimate evil whatever it was Pretty interesting. All right, let's see what we got here. Answer a couple more of these and I'm gonna get back to work. Strange gems, Peru, Cusco is said to be the navel of the earth. Yeah, there's Cusco and then there's also Giza, so in some ways, those two areas complement each other. And both of them are huge energy and energy centers on the planet. And there was a lot of commerce in deep antiquity between Africa and Peru. And that's a whole nother show I'm working on as well. It's a pretty, pretty interesting story. Uh, somebody say, when do you sleep? <laughs> I don't sleep, man. I'm literally up nonstop. Nonstop. I take power naps, 10, 15 minutes here, 10, 15 minutes there. When I'm, uh, you know, I have a driver. So when I'm going somewhere, I'll take a nap in the car on my way to my destination. And I just keep on going. I'm like a machine. Uh, let's see here. Oh, Stephen Edward, what time does the investment opportunity end on Friday? Uh, let me check my phone just because I'm on the. Let's see, can I go to the website from here? Let me check. Here's the website right here. Let me check this tab. So it ends um, right now. We have 48 hours left, or less than less than 48 hours. Let me tell you the exact amount of time we got left. I'll try to refresh this page and this other link real quick, uh, and I'll drop the link in here to you guys in the chat if you want to take advantage of the opportunity. 
You got 40 hours left. 40 hours. Four, no, 48 hours exactly. 48 hours. If you want to buy shares of Forbidden Knowledge, you only have 48 hours to get shares. After that, you won't be able to get them anymore. Okay? And what does that mean? The shares are only $1.50 each. Minimum, you have to spend is $250. Uh, and those shares roll into what we call a cap table as we move into our Reg A Plus. And then the Reg A Plus is rolling into a NASDAQ offering first quarter of 2023. So your shares will become publicly tradable when we hit NASDAQ. And if you understand what that means in stock markets, when a company's IPO to go on public uh, or going from a Reg CF to an A Plus to go on public, it's a very good thing in a lot of cases. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not making any guarantees of profits. But what I can tell you is things are looking very good. Our pre-money valuation went from $20 million to $30 million. And by the time we hit NASDAQ, it's probably going to be over $50 million pre-money valuation. So it's looking very good. We're excited about it. And what are we taking public exactly? Forbidden knowledge. I'm going to make forbidden knowledge common knowledge. Our streaming TV network is our big driving force. Over 6,000 shows up there, 10 new shows in post-editing, uh, one new documentary releasing in movie theaters next week, and then coming to and then coming to the TV network uh, a couple of weeks after that. And uh, new documentaries already in the works and movies in the works. So it's a huge entertainment company with conscious entertainment and also our book publishing company as well. So you want to take advantage of it. I'm dropping a link in the chat right now. There's only 48 hours left to get shares. If you don't do it, kick yourself <laughs> later. You know, you had an opportunity to get Bitcoin when it was a dollar, to get Microsoft when it was five dollars, to get Tesla when it was fifty dollars, you know, to get uh, Apple when it was only ten dollars, you know, Amazon when it was five dollars. And then a lot of people didn't do anything. They kept going, ah, you know, and then look at everything blown up everybody who who invested became very wealthy uh so it's a great opportunity i got i make sure each one of my kids i have five children well they're all adults now but they all have five thousand shares each one of them and my grandkids i have four grandchildren they all have five thousand shares as well because i think that's a i think that's a, a that's a good number you know when this thing goes public it could put them in a very good potentially put them in a very good financial position for the rest of their life so you got to you got to build legacy. If you're not building legacy, then what are you doing out here? It's all about building legacy, building for the future. If you focus on building the future, your current situation is guaranteed. Abundance is guaranteed. So I focus on building legacy. That's all I work on. All right, let's see what we got here. <clears throat> Minority reporter, are you a Mason? No, I'm not a Mason, but I know more than Masons because I studied all their stuff. I, I, I study everything. I know more than me. I know Masons that ask me questions about their own stuff. They don't even know the answers to it. Most people don't even know what a Mason actually even is. I may do a whole video on that, too. A lot of these Mason clubs that you see around your city, they're just places for old guys to go hang out, chase women, and drink, to be honest with you. They have no real ancient knowledge. There's nothing really being taught there. It's a hangout club. <clears throat> Duran Childs, why do the elite keep the secrets the secret space program hiding. So Duran is asking, why are they hiding the secret space program? Good question. You have to understand that the way you control a planet like Earth is from space. Whoever controls space around the Earth controls the planet itself. And what does that mean? If you have control of space, you have control of launch windows, you have control of orbiting uh, orbital uh, debris and, and like satellites and other devices, technological devices that can orbit the planet. Um, you have control over what Lagrange points things can orbit. You have control over what objects in space you can shoot down from some other country launching something like a ballistic missile. You have all this in place. Then once you have that in place, you control the planet. At any moment in time, you can say, okay, uh, whatever country you are, you don't want to participate. You don't want to. You don't want to collaborate with us. You don't want to fall in line with what we're telling you to do. We'll just take out all your satellites, and then what are you going to do? You have no internet, no cell phone service, nothing. We'll knock out your satellites. You're done. Or we can blast you from space. They have this thing called the Rods of God. It's a 20 foot tungsten steel rod 
that they dropped from a satellite with pinpoint accuracy on your city and blow up your entire city with no nuclear fallout, no, no warhead, just kinetic energy. So controlling space is important. Now, along, come, coming along with controlling space is secrecy. How do you put these things in place and have this capability to have this technological power and keep it a secret? You have to have a secret space program. You know, we have the X-33B, X-33B, X-37B military shuttle system that launches and goes up and goes away into space for two years at a time. They publicly announced the launch and they publicly announced the landing, but the mission is top secret. Where is it going and who is it going to see? So all this stuff is going on. All this stuff is being built up there, all in secret, all in secret. And keeping it in secret keeps them in power. They keeps them dominating the planet and dominating humanity. When there's no secrets, then all of a sudden the power dissipates. It's all about power and control. Crazy people in here. All right. When is round three? Nigel Watson was acting about the shares again. When is round three? So, Nigel, uh, there won't be a round three for the public, for the general public. Round two is the end of it for everyone. Round three is really a reggae plus, and the reggae plus is already sold out. That's $20 million. It's already done. We already have that locked. After that, we use a lot of that money in marketing. 58% uh, goes into marketing and content. And uh, that's going to explode the company and take us to over 100,000 subscribers in a year. And it's also going to co cover a lot of the cost of going to NASDAQ, which is probably going to cost about two or three million dollars. So that's there's not going to be around three, uh, unfortunately, for the general public. That's why I keep pushing and telling everybody I was going live a lot, telling people, hey, it's your opportunity. Round one, round two. And that's it. People got it in round one at a dollar. Round two ended up at a dollar fifty. And 48 hours from now, there's no more. I helped as many people as I can help. I gave a lot of opportunities to a lot of people. Let me see how many people actually invested. I'll give you the number. We had um, 3,135 investors bought shares in round one and round two. Not bad. That's 3,100 people that life potentially could be changed depending on how many shares they have. Pretty interesting. So... I gave the opportunity. I didn't have to do it. Uh, my attorney was asking me why I was doing it. I said, because I want to help people. I want to find a way to take my company up and help people at the same time. Um, you know, a lot of these, nobody's really looking back to help the people that supported them and help them get to where they're going. And I want, I wanted to be able to do something like that. So I want to have a great story in the future where, you know, Billy Carson goes public and, you know, and people who got in in round one and round two, some of them people are millionaires. I want those, I want one of those kind of stories to come out. Uh, you know, make that into a TV show, a success story like that. That's what I'm looking forward to. All right, let's see. Another one here, and I got to get out of here. All right. Matt Willis, does anybody know anything about the moon being hollow or how it was put in place? And where it is now good question matt uh good question actually good questions plural so the moon is called lamu in the ancient mesopotamian and babylonian texts it's in the tablets and it used to be a moon of uh, orbiting moonlit of tiamat just like jupiter has all those moons well tiamat had a lot of moons too tiamat was the planet uh, that this was the fourth planet it orbited our sun. So you had Mercury. I'm sorry, it was the third. You had Mercury, Venus, and then you had Tiamat. Tiamat was the third planet originally. And it was four to six times larger than Earth. Massive planet, supermassive, with water and life and land. And um, Tiamat, uh, now in the early part of the solar system, during the early years, our solar system gravitationally captured another mini solar system, okay? It was a brown dwarf with planets orbiting it. But one of those planets or one of those moons, one of those planets crashed into Tiamat, bring, breaking it into pieces. A huge chunk swung away became the Earth, taking a lot of life and water and everything with it, recoalesced as the Earth. 
it also gravitationally it tugged the moon along with it. So the moon came into orbit. Now, much later, you find that the Anunnaki had visited the moon and converted the moon into a way station or a base, a moon base. They hollowed out a lot of the interior of this structure. They built substructures underneath the surface uh, and they made an entire base on the opposite side. And what they did was they set the moon into a, a locked orbit with Earth to where only one side shows as we spin. As we rotate on our axis, the moon rotates at the same exact speed, only giving us one face while they hide themselves on the opposite side. We call it the dark side of the moon. We discovered objects on the dark side of the moon in a mission called the Clementine mission. The Clementine mission was a military satellite, a low lunar orbiting satellite that was sent up uh, and it was in a low lunar orbit and it crashed into structures on the opposite side of the moon and never came home. I think they knew that was gonna happen because they called it Clementine. There's an old song called Clementine, country song, it goes, oh, my darling Clementine, you were lost and gone forever. Oh, my darling Clementine. So once I saw the name of that object, the name of that satellite, I knew it was never coming back. And as I got deeper into the research, guess what I found out? It never came back. But they did discover the objects on the opposite side and they transmitted images, which are available to the general public through the Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act, the images from the opposite side of the moon. It's not really the dark. It's not really dark over there. We just call it dark because we can't see it from Earth. But it's just the same as anywhere else. But but the images are, are uh, on the server and you can download them for free. The Clementine images. All right, guys. Uh, thank you, Reaper Hacks, for getting some shares. Um, Quest says, peace, brother. You are indeed a machine. I respect your work. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Stephen Paul, are the Anunnaki in power today? Good question. Let me answer that last one and I got to run, guys. I'll be back tomorrow. Don't forget, 8 o'clock tomorrow, 8 p.m. tomorrow. Is the God of the Bible Satan? Question mark. Tomorrow, 8 p.m. live on this YouTube account. Um, and so the Anunnaki, are they still in power? I believe that they still are in power through bloodlines, through offspring that have been given positions of power. When you look at uh, the last the last pyramid war that uh, that was being held in uh, Egypt. Amun-Ra was battling. He was hiding inside the pyramid in some uh, one of those chambers in the pyramid. One of his shit, too, helped him escape. All right, his shit, too, were his masons, his brick mason people. They helped him escape. And uh, before he left and disappeared for, for almost forever, seems like, he left and decreed the kingship and the ownership of the finances to his Ra Kam, K A M, Ra Kam. And who's the Ra Kam? Kam, K A M, translates into shield in ancient text. If you bring that name forward in time, it's the Ra Shields, Rothschilds. It's the same names, the same people. And I believe that those people are worth $700 trillion today. Their family's worth $700 trillion right now. And I believe that they're the ones controlling all the wars all the divide and conquer, all the turmoil, you know, all the left wing, right wing garbage that goes on on this planet, all the starvation, all the death and destruction, all the slavery in Libya, all of that. Ultimately, all the all the, uh, you know, the the uh, the sale of, of arms and weapons and the transportation of drugs around the planet. I believe that they're the ones at the top of that, of the top of the totem pole and decision making about all of that. And so in, in a way, and the, the answer to your question, in my opinion, is yes. All right, guys, I got to run. I right, thank you for hopping on this late night q and I'll be back again tomorrow. Don't forget 8 p.m. tomorrow. Don't forget to go get your shares. I'll drop the link one more time. There's only 48 hours left. There's less than 48 hours now. We're up to probably 47 hours and, and, and you know, I don't know, 30 minutes. So take advantage. I dropped the link in the chat. Hurry up and get them ASAP, all right? Peace. I'll see you all tomorrow. I don't go live from this studio, this YouTube studio. How do you end this thing? There you go, end stream. All right, peace.